Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. And if you can't hear me, then, well, you're not listening, and therefore you can't hear me, so I can't thank you. But you are listening, Reed Fischler, Larry Bailey, Michelle Sergio, and brand new patrons, Many Mandy's and Jim. Welcome, hey. Many Mandy's and Jim. Hey. Always good to have new patrons. On this episode of DTNS, new data implies console gaming is dying. Scott tells us it isn't dying. But it is changing, metamorphosizing, you might say. Plus, the UK goes after Microsoft over Copilot Plus recall feature. And would you pay for a better Amazon Echo? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, May 22nd, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, my goodness. Uh, everyone's mad at Microsoft. And we're going to dig into why you, you, you might be like, I'm not mad at my, yes, you are. You are very mad at Microsoft. And we will explain why after we give you the quick hits. Humane, makers of the pretty poorly reviewed $700 AI pin that used generative models to respond to voice requests and projected some answers onto a surface, is looking for a buyer, according to Bloomberg sources. Humane is led by former Apple employees Imran Chowdhury and Bethany B Bongiorno, but Bloomberg sources say that the company wants between $750 million and $1 billion for its technology. I, I bet Mark has probably had been interested in I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, possibly not. <laughs> Chinese leader Xi Jinping has a new chatbot, uh, or rather there is a chatbot based on Xi Jinping thought, according to a report by the Financial Times. It includes more than a dozen books attributed to Xi Jinping. Uh, this is more than just musings. Xi Jinping thought uh, is the third dogmatic publication attributed to a Chinese leader following Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping. Uh, their philosophical writings have been incorporated into the list of fundamental doctrines of the Chinese Communist Party. The training set also included government regulations, policy documents, state media reports, other official publications, stuff like that. It is limited to being used at a research center under the purview of the Cyberspace Administration of China, so you can't just, you know, log on anywhere in China. Uh, but maybe they will someday. They say they might eventually release it for wider use. Spotify is debuting a new look. Doesn't really change anything audio-wise, and maybe you won't even notice, unless you like fonts, because Spotify has a new oh. typeface. It's called Spotify Mix, and it's called, uh, a, a, as it's called, and is going to replace the circular typeface that you might be familiar that Spotify has across its apps and desktop experiences up until now. Spotify Mix was developed with Berlin-based foundry uh, Dianamo typefaces to make a sans serif typeface that blends features from both classic and contemporary styles. The text in Spotify's logo is also going to use the new typeface. So, oh. you know, if you feel like things are looking different, you're not crazy. And I await are. the rage. Anytime someone changes the typeface, there's always rage. Mm -hmm. uh, back in April, Google announced it would make its magic editor and other AI powered tools free for all Google Photos, Android, and iOS users. Uh, if you don't remember, Magic Editor has the magic erase feature, lets you move, resize, or erase parts of a photo, as well as apply contextual presets, stuff like that. Pixelate and Pixelate Pro folks already had this at launch, but now the older Pixel owners, 6 and 7, are starting to get it as well, and eventually it's going to come to iOS Google Photo users too. All users will get 10 Magic Editor saves per month, unless you pay for a Google One premium plan or use a Pixel. CNET got a hold of a memo that T-Mobile's president of consumer group, John Fryer, sent to employees explaining charges for some customers are going to increase, starting with their June or July bills. Now, exactly which plans are affected, not very clear right now. Fryer specifically wrote that those on T-Mobile's Go 5G plans will not see price increases. Those are their newer plans uh, as far as what T-Mobile offers, uh, nor will those on T-Mobile's price lock guarantee. As part of its merger with Sprint, which was completed back in 2020, T-Mobile was legally required to not raise prices for three years. So that was last year. Has since introduced Go 5G, uh, Go 5G Plus, Go 5G Next, which it is has been pushing to replace older plans. 
The UK Information Commissioner's Office, or ICO, wants to know more about Microsoft's recall feature for Copilot Plus PCs. We talked about this on Monday's show. Specifically, well, we talked about what, what it is on Monday's show because that's it was part of Microsoft's announcement. Specifically, the ICO wants to understand the safeguards that are in place, if there are, to protect user privacy since recall can log all of your activity and then use the Copilot model to return answers about things you've done. Maybe something that was said in a meeting that you just didn't jot down, a recipe you looked for. In theory, these searches are better than an index search because the model can understand more vague requests. Maybe you looked up a blanket, but then you close the tab and you just can't remember the name of the store. So stuff like that. Yeah, you could say like, what was the blue blanket I, I looked at recently? And supposedly recall will be able to be like, oh, it's probably this and then show you the website. The knee-jerk reaction to that convenience is rage. <laughs> uh, nightmare <laughs> privacy violation. Uh, you, I don't want to give Microsoft all this data about me. That's ridiculous. Uh, that a company the size and scale of Microsoft wants to access this data, probably to sell ads or worse. Microsoft emphasized in its announcement that the data used for recall is stored on the PC. It is not stored in the cloud. It's also encrypted with a key under your control, not under Microsoft's control, and can only be accessed by the person whose profile was used to sign into the computer. And with biometric login, that means you can use something to make sure it's more than just a password that is protecting that computer. So someone to get to that data would have to have physical access to your computer and be able to log into your account somehow. Uh, then you can also filter out websites and apps from being scanned. You can say, you know what? I don't want my YouTube viewing in there. Don't log YouTube and it won't. You can also pause collection. If you're like, you know what? I'm planning a surprise party and just in case, you know, make sure don't, don't keep any of this stuff for the next hour or whatever. You can also delete some or all of the data you collected at any time. This is all under your control. And of course, you also can choose not to use recall at all on a PC. You could probably not even buy a Copilot Plus PC, in which case you wouldn't even have access to recall. So I don't know how you would have this feature and make it more secure and more under the user's control than the way they have implemented it, which makes me think some people are like, I just don't want this to exist. I don't, I don't want there to be a feature that collects all of my behaviors on my machine and then tries to benefit me with it. There's still a question of whether it will benefit people. I think Microsoft maybe needs to do more work in regards to, I mean, maybe there's no winning this battle, but more work in regards to telling people what they want this for. Because uh, right now it is, it does feel like a feature nobody asked for. I've heard some people in my circle say, well, actually, this thing I have this idea for, I think it would work great for this. This is perfect for me. But most people seem to be like, well, I don't know who's asking for this. Like, why is this a thing that we want? And maybe Microsoft can demonstrate that better as time. They demonstrated goes on. it Monday, but sort of Monday was not streamed. It was right. only shown to the press. Uh, and I thought they demonstrated it very well, which was to say, like, you you have done that search of your email. You've done the search on your computer with the index search where you know that piece of data is there and you can't find it. This is going to make sure you find it. Yeah. And you and won't have to try to remember, like, what is the exact name that will make the search return come? You can vaguely describe it and it will return. Microsoft showed that. Nobody heard it. Right. Right. It's the Satya Nadella video that's going around that I think people are reacting to the most. And that one seemed a little bit vague. My only real complaint is knowing that I can ha not have it on or have it on or, you know, kind of be as picky as I want to as the user, as you explained, I think very well. Uh, my biggest complaint is I think the name is terrible. When you say, are you going to get Windows 11 recall? Oh, what did, what happened to Windows 11? <laughs> did they recall Windows 11? Yeah, That's it's a, a terrible name. But other than <laughs> it's, that, I, it's, it's fine. I mean, it's context, right? Uh, sure, on, yeah. on Monday, um, from not, not just like people who don't know anything about tech who do sometimes ping me about tech stuff, you know, because it's like Sarah's the tech person. But people who work in tech talked to me on Monday, more than one person, and was like, can you believe this recall thing? What a nightmare. And I was like, is it? I mean, first of all, you don't have to use it, but let's say you do. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who, if you can afford to have a really good personal assistant, 
you know, that person has access to not every aspect of your life, but probably a lot of them. You know them, you trust them, they make things work well for you. That's what my initial reaction was that this is. If this is something you're comfortable with, it's going to, you know, just kind of be like, hey, what was that thing? Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, that, that because I do that all day, every day. Uh, one of my yeah. friends said, so, I mean, but Sarah, would you want someone to like take a photo of you every 10 minutes? And I'm like, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, that, yeah. Like, yeah. You know, like I'm just, there's, there's a certain element of privacy that's very important to me. But this doesn't feel like it's infringing on that. But privacy. this also isn't taking a picture of you every ten minutes. But that's no. what people think it's doing. Yeah, uh, it's not much more than what you already have on your device, which is all your data. All your data is on your device. Yeah. All this is doing is making it easier yeah. to access it, uh, keeping a history, which is a little more than what you have on your device right now. You have Windows Restore points, but maybe you don't have full history, so it's keeping more data. And the only liability I could think is because that history exists there could be legal implications where you would be subpoenaed. Now, you might not be compelled by a judge to unlock your device. That might be considered, uh, you know, testifying against yourself, but it might not. That part of the law is not exactly settled yet. Uh, the number of people that would run into that use case are very low. There might be some companies who don't want to turn this on because they they don't want to have this information collected in case of a future court case, especially if they're in a very sensitive profession. But that's really the only legitimate concern I can see here. All the rest of it is like, no, everyone just doesn't trust. They're like, well, Microsoft will eventually put this in the cloud, right? I'm like, sure, I guess maybe. And when they do, stop it, turn it off. But right now it is very, very, very much under your control and i know the three varies don't make it more very but i just had to say it that way yeah, yeah there, there was one um because I was, I was trying to sort of figure out where some of this rage was coming from like okay what are you specifically worried about happening um and there was a there was an example that uh somebody on on x had made of like you know what if you're in a you know a, a domestic relationship where you're concerned about your safety and your privacy. And I thought, well, okay. But I mean, that would be something that you are already concerned about if someone has access to a computer that you're using. Now, mm -hmm. maybe this would give them all that much more information and that's something to, to think about, but I don't really think it changes the rules. No, no. no. It, and if you're in that kind of situation, you would probably not be keeping history in other areas too, like browser history and stuff like that. Right, so yeah, right. that is a great point. You would probably not want to use that. Uh, you would want to make sure that you don't use recall in those situations. But I don't think that means we should deny the feature sh existence. Uh, I think it is very useful and, and and very well implemented. Granted, I could be wrong. Maybe it comes out and people find out there's a bunch of holes in it and it's insecure and all that, in which case, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take it all back. But assuming it's properly implemented, which I think it seems like it should be, uh, this this is a legitimate product uh, that some people will want to make use of and can make use of securely. Remember, it's encrypted. So it's, it's going to be very difficult to even exfiltrate it if somebody hacked into your machine. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't see a lot of bl glaring weaknesses that are any more than any other data you have. Yeah, I would. The only other thing I would add on top of this is that if you are somebody who's still sort of like, well, I don't get the use case, think of it this way your every day or every moment activity on your computer, this is like backup for that in the way that your files are being backed up all the time, either off site or locally on a hard drive. And you want to access, access those quickly. You use software to do that. I know I had this file yesterday. Oh, there it is. This is like that, but for stuff you saw, something you browsed, something you popped open for a second, a file you opened and then shut. Like it's, it really is an extension of that. If, if you're looking for a good metaphor, I think that that's how. Roger how points it out it's no different than Apple Time Machine, except that it's going to be a lot like that, yeah. easier to access the information. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, people with knowledge of Amazon's plans are talking to CNBC. My guess is these are people from Amazon who have been authorized to leak this to the CNBC. Uh, but it, they say, hey, uh, Amazon's going to have a much more conversational version of the voice assistant for Echo devices later this year. 
because everyone is talking about OpenAI and Microsoft and Google this week, so we don't want to be left out, so we leaked this to CNBC. Uh, the upgraded voice assistant will probably only be available with a subscription, though, according yeah. to these sources, and it would not be included with Amazon Prime. Sources told CNBC that Amazon had not yet settled on how much it will charge. Another reason they might want to leak this out and maybe get an idea of what people would pay. CEO Andy Jassy has previously mentioned that Amazon was integrating generative models into multiple applications including quoting now an even more intelligent and capable Alexa. So this is not a new concept. It's just that the week everybody else is making announcements, Amazon's leaking it to CNBC. And the new idea would be that you would only get it if you pay. So Scott, would you pay for a better Amazon Echo? Well, I might. Um, I mean, my I feel like my Echo gets a lot of basic uses, and I use it every day for certain things that it's just sort of inherently good at. But I don't really use it beyond that. And I think I'm sure I'm not using it in ways they wish I was. Um, it's mostly to play a playlist or turn on a light or something like that. So maybe this gets me there. The biggest hurdle I have here is I'm looking, if I'm to look past the here and now, this kind of stuff is going to be expected to be free. Is, this feels like charging for texts back in the 90s in in a, in a way to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that lasts. I think at some point these things become like search or these things become like um, sort of ubiquitous website usage where I'm not required to pay for every single thing I do. It's considered like a top level thing and you either support it with ads or some other way. But I don't think that lasts. And I think Google turns right around and says, hey, guess what? All our Google Home devices yeah. are going to be free. And they all have the upgrade. And everyone's going to go, oh, maybe I'll look at a Google device next because I don't want to pay Amazon any more money for this. Also, so I think, I think it's a bad idea. Also, rumor to not be something that would be uh, bundled into a Prime subscription, right. which which I pay for and has has steadily crawled up in price over the last five years. Yeah. You know, If that were to, hey, you know, here's a perk of Prime. And maybe that one hundred thirty dollar uh, Prime subscription per year, you know, is that much sweeter to you? Great, wouldn't wouldn't say no to that. I don't think I would pay for this uh, on its own. I really don't. I I also I have an Echo, uh, an Echo Show, which is in my kitchen, um, and I have a couple Amazon Assistant powered Sono speakers um, that I you know chirp at throughout the day. But I kind of I know what I'm getting back. I know, you know, I know what to ask. I know how to ask it. Sometimes it flubs. This morning, uh, my Echo Show weirdly um, was serving me like a, would you like a toilet brush? Which is weird because I actually do need one, um, even though I haven't been searching for one. So I don't know what's going on there. Uh, good timing, I suppose. But I was sort of like, yes, but <clears throat> can you show me this item, but in black? Yeah. And uh, it was like, no idea what you're talking no, about. No, you know? I can't do that. <laughs> you know, like, like where I'm like, you know, if it was like, if it was as good as just me saying like, oh, flippantly, like, yeah, could you do that? But change it a little bit. Great. Um, we're just not there all the time. So yeah, if, um, if I could get it to be better, because uh, it's not very good other than like turn on and off the lights. Uh, but anytime I ask it a piece of information, like I have a 10% chance of it answering. Uh if it's better, if it sounds better, and if it stops nagging me about using Amazon services, which it just randomly does once every other day, uh, when you, you know, I tell it to turn on the lights and it's like, hey, did you also know you can order lights? For I'm like, no, just stop it. I, I will that. pay. I will pay for that. Now, I don't want to pay a lot. Buck 99 a month, maybe I could probably do uh, something like that. So if you keep it real cheap, uh, yeah, I, I might pay for it. I don't know how many other people would, though. I think Scott's right. A lot of people are just going to look at this and go, why don't you just make the product work? I paid for the product already. Yeah, and it will be an early grab on this stuff. And later that will, I just guarantee you it'll change. It's too top level. It's too, it's too much. And I use the example of texting and paying for every text you did in the 90s. And I knew then, I'm like, this will not stand. There's no way this lasts. It's too ridiculous. It's too much of a, I need this all the time. You can't pay, pay per character. And this feels like that, uh, or in the way that search used to. There were early search engines that wanted me to pay to get better search results. Google came along and said, nope, it's all free. That just changed the paradigm, and that will change immediately. And Amazon's going to go, well, us too then, I guess. And I don't know. It just feels yeah. loosey -goosey. And the problem is Amazon is not able to make the money off of the Echo that it thought it would be able to. People just don't shop on it in enough numbers to pay for it, which is why I'm guessing they're not bundling this into Prime. 
uh, and they're making it a separate subscription because they're just they're just not seeing the return on selling these things. And the amount they charge for them is is pretty close to cost, if not under cost. Yeah. Uh, so and, and it's expensive to to run uh, voice services. It's going to be more expensive to run a more capable large language model powered one. So yep. uh, they are and going I, to need to make that money back somehow. I agree. And I think the the there's there's a difference between well some there, there's an overlap, but. There's a difference between saying that something is more conversational and that something is better. Oh, yeah. No, I want it to be both. <laughs> I don't well, care so, well, so, so much do about the conversational, so but, but the context know, and show me this in black. Yeah, that's what yeah. I care about the most. Yeah, that yeah. whole kind of like, I want a friend that lives inside my echo. Like, I don't need <laughs> that, really. I just want it to be better. Yeah, yeah. I, I want it to understand what I'm saying and and continue to understand what I'm saying, which it's gotten somewhat better at. But sure. it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, you know, I, I look forward to to it being as good as the open AI and Google demos from earlier last week. If anybody has a beautiful toilet brush in black, they'd like to send me the link to. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't I send her your actual brush. No. Yeah, no, she not, wants yours. A new one. not yours. Not yeah. yours. Uh, yeah, I want one that's still in the plastic. Uh, what would you like to hear us talk about on the show? More about toilet brushes? Less about toilet brushes? Something related to toilet brushes or unrelated to toilet brushes? Let us know in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at Daily Tech News Show dot reddit dot com a report from market research company new zoo is getting a lot of attention because it might look bad for game consoles the report showed an 8.4 percent increase in pc games and related digital sales uh, between 2023 um, going back to 2022 consoles rose 0.3 percent okay so There's that. Mobile gaming also fell about 2%. Now, if you're looking at total revenue for 2023, Nuzu estimates mobile gaming coming in just under $90 billion. Consoles, $52.4 billion. PC gaming hovering around $39 billion. So, Scott, for those who are saying, "Uh uh-oh, looking bad for consoles, uh, you know, is this a real trend? Well, there's definitely a trend happening, and I have a couple of theories, and some of it I think is based on the facts, and some of it is might be just wishful thinking on my part. But I do see some changes happening in that business, and in particular, what we're seeing is a kind of homogenization across the entire business. Um, that includes everything from engines that are unified across platforms, things like Unity and Unreal. They are designed from the ground up now to be things that can be uh, used to build games everywhere. Um, and some of that includes multiplayer technology and other things to keep all this stuff sort of flowing. That means that if you buy something on mobile or you buy it on PC or you buy it on desktop or a console or something, uh, for all intents and purposes, you're getting roughly the same experience. Now, there's all sorts of arguments to be made about no controllers on phones. How can you use touchpad there? We can get into those nitty gritties, but I don't, I don't think this is indicative of that. What this is telling me is that, um, they're all basically PCs at the end of the day. These consoles are all based on x86 architecture. They use GPUs that are very similar to GPUs that are equivalent on the PC side. In fact, if anything, they're outdated the day they get launched because PCs tend to be faster with updates when it comes to GPUs and you know faster, uh, faster technology to run your games better. So as a result, you have the PC looking more and more like its purists have always said, the better place to play your games. But now it's becoming practical. Uh, these devices are less expensive than ever. When I say device, I mean computer. Everyone kind of needs or has a need for a computer for the most part. So you've already kind of got one. And they come capable. They used to be, well, if you want to play games on this, expect to spend this much more and buy all these extra parts and you know, don't go to Walmart or whatever. It's not so true anymore. You can kind of go to Costco, Walmart, Sam's Club, whatever, and buy a PC that you don't even intend to game with that is capable enough to run a lot of games. Now, will it do the latest and greatest ray tracing? Will it be the ultimate? No, but really neither are these consoles uh, three years on. So uh, I think that there's just sort of a feeling in general with the gaming public where they're like, well, why don't I just do this anyway? And if they really want to get crazy with it, they buy Steam Decks and ROG Allies and these other portable devices with their own screens that run their games in a unified ecosystem like Steam or Epic or a Windows Store or any of those things. And they get to take that stuff with them, plug it into TVs and whatnot. So all of those lines are being blurred. We used to have these differences of it's a little plastic thing that you would buy. And the reason you got is the graphics were were better than you got on PCs. Well, that's not true anymore. In fact, it's the opposite now. Um, 
you're starting to see the loss of exclusives being a big deal on consoles, whereas it was very important that if you didn't get a PlayStation, then you weren't going to get these very specific games. And that's changing on PlayStation, certainly on on the Xbox side. Maybe not Nintendo so much, but they're kind of their own case, and they go by their own timeline. We'll see how they end up in the future. But overall, you're seeing these exclusives either come out day and date on PCs and other consoles, or sometimes with a bit of a delay, six months, a year, but they still end up in these places. And a lot of gamers are just okay waiting because they have a giant backlog. So there's like a lot of factors involved. Um, Mm. Obviously, we're not at the same number. As you mentioned, 39 billion in the PC market, consoles at 52.4. I mean, I remember in the entire industry, it was around 10. So this is, I'm starting to feel old, but um, that those numbers aren't quite lining up, obviously. Mobile outpacing all of it. And everybody's still chasing that tail, but as you note, as you mentioned, that's two percent down uh, year over year for that period. So I don't know. A lot of it is sort of up in the air. Roger, I know you and I uh, follow a lot of these same sort of trends and have interesting thoughts about them. Do you think, personally, I don't think this threat to answer Sarah's question. I don't think this threatens consoles so much. It just shows that the future is more of this homogenized shared space where platforms matter less than services and games. I think I think what happened is around, and this is about 10, 15 years ago, what people, I'll wind it back real quick. The reason why we had video game consoles at home was because there was a technological limitation. In other words, in order to produce the kind of gaming that you wanted, that you got out of a console on the home computer, you had to spend a lot of extra money on ships that weren't always used and consumers weren't willing to pay that because I don't play games on my computer. I will buy a Sega Genesis. I will buy a Super Nintendo. We are at the point where hard, basic computer hardware will perform most of those functions equally as well as what you were saying, Scott. Mm-hmm. So there really isn't a need to have a siloed technological base, right? And Xbox has you know, an x86 or a PS3. A PS4 has an x86 you know, a, a Nintendo Switch has a, a an ARM processor and an NVIDIA chip. Um, that that reason has gone away. So what the what you're going to ha- going forward, what you're going to have separate all these uh, uh, platforms is really not just services, but the games or uh, the games and the style of gameplay that you can provide. And for a lot of people, uh, PCs are just a flexible thing. If I can get everything I want off Steam, off Epic Game Store. Um, why would I turn to a console? A really good friend of mine, they moved over to a gaming PC because they have a they have a young child and they don't play as much. So having something connected to the TV is one less thing for the kid to grab and drag around. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's also it's also a very flexible uh, environment. You can justify I can justify buying a new GPU for my PC because it's for work. Right. Uh, I need to I need to stream the show, yeah. uh, so you can you can tell yourself a lot of things that you'll spend money on, but when it comes to when it comes to game consoles, it's a little less. Like game consoles don't even really make good set talk streaming boxes compared to like a hundred dollar Chinese you know Android box. Yeah, that's a whole other aspect of this I didn't even think about. But there you know is there still value to having a box under your TV that does all your stuff? Absolutely, but when it comes to gaming. You're just having less reasons why there needs to be this divide. It starts to feel weird, like, well, why are we even doing this? What is the difference between this x86 box under my TV and this thing I have in here? And actually, now I can stream that someplace or to 10 different places, and and I can have real-time gaming experiences on my phone that are streaming from my PC with Steam Link or something else. Like, there just aren't these hard edges anymore. The borders are blurry. And I don't think it means consoles go away, at least not in the very near term. I just think it means their business practices change. They do more games on more platforms all at once, make maximum money that way and not have to wait until, you know, a year passes or whatever. And that's what it's Sony is having the hardest time with this, to be honest. Everybody else it's is kind of on board, but they're they're an electronics company. That's their right. that's their background. Nintendo toy company, Microsoft software services company. Yeah. Microsoft's probably gonna have the easiest time because they can sell you all their fun services. Yeah. I, I just listening to, to y'all talk, what it sounds like is we we ha- more of the money is still in consoles, so it's not going away anytime soon. It's gonna right. be a slow decline. Mm-hmm. And with that slow decline comes the rise of cross platform, including cloud, and consoles probably just slowly become set top boxes. Something that's like, oh, you know what? I wanna be able to play games on my TV without having to use another device. 
the same reason you get a Roku or an Apple TV or an NVIDIA Shield, uh, and in fact, the NVIDIA Shield is perfect because it has the games on it too, uh, you'll get a set-top box that can play games uh, and attach it to your TV specifically for that. Some TVs will have it built in. Uh, mm -hmm. just, it'll, it'll, it, it looks like that is the future game consoles never go away. They just morph into streaming boxes. Yeah. And the news yeah. isn't that PCs are taking over. The news is actually the opposite. The news is that everything's kind of just spreading just merging out. out. Just yeah. Merging becoming out. platform independent. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes in from Anon Jr., who wrote uh, on Patreon in response to our conversation in Good Day Internet about job retraining. Anon says, seems another big part of career changes is where you go and how it relates to existing skills. For a logical type who does a lot of writing, coding, that isn't a, that big of a stretch. For myself, my degree is in programming. I spent 14 years managing the software and online training catalog for a mid-sized hospital. I burned out and I left. After a few years of returning to retail sales to help my sister and do a sabbatical, I'm four years into a new career as a luthier. It's not as odd a jump as it sounds, given I roadied for a small band on the side and did basic repair work. I also spend a lot of time learning basic woodworking from my father and stepfather. I wonder sometimes how much harder it would have been to get shunted into some field that I had no handhold on. A luthier is somebody who makes stringed musical instruments in case, you know, oh. you were among the many people who didn't, who didn't know what that was, uh, yeah. which is why he's like, yeah, I worked as a roadie. So, you know, it totally makes sense. Uh, and I love this. Uh, Anand Jr., thanks for sharing your story with us. I didn't realize this this was the uh, this was the road. And it, it shows that everybody's going to have a different story with this kind of stuff. If you, if you do have to retrain and move uh, to something else, not everyone's going to become a luthier, obviously. Uh, but there might be something else where you're like, well, I actually have that skill. And that skill is the skill you're like, I can never make a career out of it. That's what Andrew Main was talking about yesterday. Like in the future, maybe you can. Maybe maybe some of these careers that that can't make enough money can make enough money because of the change in the economy. Well, thank you to everybody who sends us feedback uh, every day. Uh, we get a lot of feedback and we read them all. Uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send your deepest, darkest thoughts and also a toilet uh, uh, cleaner that is in black. Uh, thank you to <laughs> you, Scott Johnson. Uh, I just assume that you have your own toilet cleaners, so you don't do. need to send any of yours to me. But mm. uh, where should we send folks your way? Well, uh, if you want to hear more about our hot takes on these these shifts in the industry when it comes to gaming and hardware and technology in the gaming space, check out the show Core on Thursday nights. Uh, we put that thing right up on podcast after, but if you want to watch us live, you can do that as well. You can find info at frogpants.com slash core, and there is a ton to talk about, so check it out. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Is the press too positive about AI? And why don't I notice that? Uh, that's, that's something we're going to discuss in relation to some research that has been done that's showing, yeah, the, the press maybe is a little too much of a cheerleader. You can catch DTNS live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Rob Dunwood and I are back at it again tomorrow. I think there'll be some tech news. Hope to see you there. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>